I did want to tell you guys about a dream I had. I was in a game store rifling around some things, and I found a a very rare Saturn game uh-huh. called Catch a Wheat. Catch a Wheat? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Catch a Wheat. And the, there's an exclamation point you can sort of infer at the end of Wheat. And it used the Saturn fishing controller, which, as we know, there was no Saturn fishing controller in real life. Yeah, there was. I got one right over here. I'm just kidding. Also, I didn't know that. I, I have no reason to have known that. That's one of those, as we all know, uh, deployments that does not actually uh, always be something that everybody all knows. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but then there, it also had like a big, thick booklet with all these charts and stats and stuff. And um, you know, I couldn't couldn't fully read it because it was in Japanese and in my dream. But <laughs> oh, uh, dream, Jay. I, yeah, that'll I, get you. I inferred that it was like um, seasonal charts and growing schedules so that you knew when to catch the the wheat the best wheat Mm -hmm. so it was like using the best of the saturn's capabilities by having the superscalar technology to have all these individual swaying wheat stocks Mm -hmm. and you would just cast out and you would try to catch the good wheat anyway pretty fun brandon i just want to I, I just want you to know that in case audio or video ever leaks of me doing stand-up comedy uh i i have a, a bit about like of all the offensive horrible things i could say up here uh the one that would likely it would get me canceled the quickest is i had a dream last night and then i go on for about three minutes talking about how nobody is ever able to perfectly attentively listen to any words following I had a dream last (laughs) night. So I just want to let you know, it's not about that. uh, If you ever do hear uh, audio of that, it's not, (laughs) it's not about your Sega Saturn dream. It's about another one that was much worse. couldn't run the schoolyard chromo. This is episode 293 of Insert Credit, a guided discussion with a panel of video game experts and a horrible buzzer. I'm Alex Jaffe, and the freeware RPG that probably had the biggest impact on me was Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden, chapter one of the Hoops Barkley saga. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Frank Cifaldi, and the freeware RPG that had the biggest impact on me uh, I believe is the only one I've ever played for more than a, a couple minutes, which is a uh, space funeral. Hmm. Um, played that one through. Uh, so, so, so space funeral would be my answer. It's a good one. It is a, a good, good answer. One. I've never played it. I, I, Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well it's a good, uh, I don't know, proto, proto undertale, you know, it was kind of tapping into the stuff that he would tap into later. I don't know if it like holds up now, you know, in, in a, in a post undertale world, but, uh, uh, I enjoyed it. I think it. it still holds up very well. It's really great. All okay, right. great. Space funeral. Thanks, mysterious voice. Yeah, we'll find out more about that <laughs> voice in a minute. <laughs> we'll find out more about a voice. Tim Rogers here. Uh, <laughs> the the shareware uh, shareware freeware freeware RPG that had the most impact on me. Is that what you're asking? Yes. I might just have to hand it to uh, to hand it to uh, uh, Tales of Game Studios. Yeah. Might just have to hand it to Hoops Barkley Saga, because that was made by people who were, some of whom were posters on a forum where I posted. And uh, I thought, oh, that's cool. They're making a video game, and it's stupid as heck, and it's weird as heck. And then you start playing it, and you're like, oh, this is real. You know what sucks? I can't I can't get it running right. Uh, I think I can't get audio running or something on, on modern hardware. It's uh, kind of unfortunate. I played it long ago. So I, I very recently played an answer that I would I would have given, were it not a spoiler for something... I'm going to say much later about something else. So we'll, keep uh, we'll that just in hand mind. it. We'll hand it to Tales of uh, Tales of Game Studios with an asterisk. Yeah, and I want to. I want a, 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 a little addendum to to my answer, which is uh, all old RPGs uh, are freeware to me. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh I thought yeah. That was going to come up. No, they yeah. can all be. Yeah. I'm Brandon Sheffield. I think the freeware RPG that had the most influence on me was either Ramble Planet or. Void Pyramid by A. Hagen. I've played all those A. Hagen's and I like them. Uh, Ramble Planet has a lot of like weird, uh, what, do you, what, do, what would you say? It has a lot of strange iconography and text about a made up place that feels interesting and real. And Void Pyramid kind of takes that 
a little bit further and uh it's just a a strange weird experience that you can have and both of them are very well full well formed fully formed rpgs that you can enjoy on either your pc or your android phone for free so check those out all right uh well we have a guest with us this week as you may have uh surmised a bit earlier joining us is the editor and curator of the crpg book a free online guide to the history of computer role-playing games felipe Pepe. so wait a minute so like there, there's there's kind of this trend on the show of frank doesn't know who the guest is until the yeah. guest starts talking and uh all i got uh-huh. was someone named felipe it's like all right <laughs> i guess we'll figure out who that is later i know felipe how's it going felipe hi frank so uh i'm felipe pepe thank you for inviting me and my favorite free RPG will be, uh, if we are counting roguelikes, and we should, it should be Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, which is mm-hmm. like, not only it's like one of the most interesting, but also I got planes for so long with like those weird classes, like you can make an octopus that use eight daggers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> kill people, and it's amazing. If we're not counting those, then it will be those RPG Maker Pokemon games because I play so many of those and try to make my own as well. Oh man, I've always I've always meant to play a bootleg Pokemon game. What's like the good one? Oh, that could be like such a long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, I think the best one right now is probably the the Italian one, which is uh, Xenoverse, mm-hmm. which sounds like the, the Dragon Ball game, but it's like a, a special. Uh, Pokemon game and it's so good they have so many games they have seasons like they do like uh it feels like a complete professional game but it's like a fan game it's so great yeah this is a world I've always really wanted to get into but haven't had an in just these like fan games that are just these enormous labors of love uh but I feel like that's something you're very plugged into not into the community, but I always love them because it's that thing that, like, uh, they are for people who have been playing Pokemon for 20 years, you know? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have, like, that, that difficulty curve starting, like, very low. It goes all the way hardcore from the start, and it's so much fun to play, like, a, a really challenging and, like, a really complex. Because Pokemon is very complex already, but they just, Nintendo just goes, like, very easy on us. Oh, yeah. Seeing someone go, like, 100% full power from the start is such an interesting experience. I feel like Nintendo, in the the overarching uh, design, the campaign design of every Pokemon game, just asks you to do, like, one or at most, like, three things when building your team for every scripted challenge right and it's like i i've looked into some of these uh the pokemon maniac games and it's like it's pretty neat uh, what you can accomplish design wise by by asking the player to do like 12 or 13 things right like uh it's pretty neat there's a lot of potential there it reminds me of like optional dragon quest dungeons yeah there's like that level of uh extra stuff you can do so frank you won last week's episode which means you get to come up with a question for this week's did you cook anything up for us um i didn't uh cook anything up um let's let's defer to your backup question that you have for me um but uh maybe check in with me again and see if uh uh, any inspiration is struck by the end of the show is that uh, work a good deal sure okay Uh, in that case i'd like to kick off by asking if we'd like to briefly address that nintendo direct that just happened yeah um i can't believe nintendo killed guys in a submarine right oh my god yeah, horrible. I've I've heard of Sub Hunt, but this is ridiculous. Top ten video game submarines. What do you got? In the Hunt is that number one? In the Hunt, that's, that's number one. Yeah, that's the metal slug of submarines. Yeah, metal metal uh, submarine. You know, steel Diver is fine. Yeah, yeah, it's a little, a little awkward. Hunt for Red October for NES is good, dude. Is it Hunt for Red October for NES? Yeah, game's legit. What's that one PS2 game? Uh, Sub Rebellion. Mm-hmm, Sub Rebellion. Sub Rebellion's all right. Prisoner of Ice. Prisoner of Ice. As I recall, you can transform into a submarine in Banjo Tooie. Don't count that one, no. Right. Um, Banjo Tooie uh, can uh, get out of town for all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's fine. Uh, but you could make one on Banjo, the the third one. That's not right, bolts. bolts. Yeah, you know that I would count. We'll count that one. Submarine mini game in Final Fantasy VII. How about that one? Fight Emerald Weapon down there. Uh, submarine in Super Mario Land. Oh, that's true. That's true. I think it's sub because it's a plane. Yeah. Yeah. It's a plane and it's a submarine, but the submarine one is cool. Nice design on that. Speaking of the submarine and the video games, did you all hear how Logitech lost like 
a huge amount of stock value be- when That's so it was crazy. discovered that their controller was controlling that sub. Like no. that just shows you how stupid money is. Social media. Like, it also no. shows you how stupid social media is. To be fair, yeah, it's a uh, it's this perfect storm of of money in social media. You know, yeah. I don't even want to talk about the sure. submarine thing. Uh, we are recording this after the news of the ultimate fate of the submersible has yeah. been released. Uh, we know what I'm happened. I'm so relieved that they're okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Every time I look at uh, the social media the past couple of uh, uh, months, I'm just glad that I don't uh, post <laughs> anymore. Yeah. It's just like, I don't, I don't think anybody had anything chill to say about the submarine. Nobody had anything chill to say about it. I certainly it. didn't. Yeah, that's good. It's... Uh, it's just the sort of thing, you know, just people saying stuff for saying stuff's sake, you know. I don't want to sit here and, and lament this sort of thing, but this is the sort of thing I am going to do for the rest of my life. I am going to lament uh, uh, people who say stuff when it's just as easy to not say anything. And it's not even a case. I'm not like oh, the poor billionaires or anything. It's just like at the, you know, there's just no nothing chill happened there. This is inarticulate on purpose. Thank you. What was that arcade machine that? That we played Frank uh, many times at California Extreme. California what Extreme. What was that, that arcade machine that we played many times, Frank? <laughs> Back in our youth. When you're a submarine and you're shooting it, shooting it like the boats that are above. Uh, and I oh, think it's I don't, I don't Sega. Know. It's, it's uh, one of those really generic early uh, sub games. There's a few of those. Yeah, mm. but it was actually pretty good. I think there was a Sega one. So I looked up the uh, Moby Games group for submarines and uh, just going to post one in chat here. Hit me with oh. them. Hit me with them, Carl. Oh, no. So we, 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 we do have a uh, Windows PC game from 1998 called Titanic, A Mysterious Undersea Adventure. Oh, if you, boy. Uh, if you yourself want to pilot a sub around the, the ruins of the Titanic. Absolutely got to love it. Is there a Kotaku article about this game yet? Periscope. Periscope is the Sega one I was thinking of. Pretty good. Pretty decent. <laughs> Oh, Periscope man. is decent. Is, it's decent. I would say. Played worse stuff than that. Aquanauts Holiday, not a submarine. Controversial. Not a submarine. That's the problem. Controversially, there. yeah. Do we count U boats? U boats don't really. They don't go all the way under, right? U boats are legit. Yeah. I mean, I would smoke a U boat because there's know. a bunch more U boat games for some reason. A lot of U boats out there. There's one for the Turbo Graphics, which is bad. If you like that. Oh, I like bad games for the Turbo Graphics. I own all of them <laughs> on my Mister. Kaboom. Yeah. There there is an entire Ubisoft series that we have not mentioned called Silent Hunter. Um, oh yeah. And it looks like there's at least five. Um and I'm gonna go ahead and put the box for five in chat here and so that you could see that they positioned it to look like an S for some reason. Oh, oh Silent yeah. Hunter. Silent Hunter yeah. fives. Yeah. I forgot there was an official DOS boat uh yeah. video game. We got a I don't know if it was good, but there was a couple hunt for red Octobers as well. Yep. The Hunt for Red October for NES, I legit like that game. I, that I, one was okay, I, right? I honestly legit. I mean, I, I genuinely like it. I, I put it on sometimes on the Mister and, and actually play it. So I do like that game. Nice. Uh, Felipe, can you tell us a little more about the one you brought up? I'm sorry, I forgot the name. A Prisoner of Ice? Yes, Prisoner of Ice. The fo- is one of those old uh, DOS adventure games. And it's basically like they do the, the Cthulhu thing where like you're in a sub and you find like uh, a Cthulhu monster. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's most of what I remember from it, sorry. <laughs> that's more than most people, I'm sure. I like it. I'm looking I'm looking into it. It looks it looks chill. It looks very yeah. good. Oh also so we gotta mention Subnautica. Somebody will get mad if we don't mention Subnautica. That oh, right. that reminds right. me. Yeah, I think my favorite game's one pretty chill. I tried to put it in our best games of of whenever, uh whatever year it was, which was that, that god darn Capcom game that I really liked. It was a Capcom, God darn Capcom, Metroidvania, Waking Mars like video game. Uh, Shinsekai. Yeah, that's it. That was a good one. I liked that, and you had a submarine in there. Also, um, Marvel vs. Capcom Three. You can play as uh, as the Submariner in that. Mm-hmm. Ah, mm-hmm. yeah. Namor. Namor. Couple, well, just a couple quick so people don't yell at us. Microprose's Silent Service, yes, and then uh, Nintendo's. Uh, uh, what is it? Radar Mission. Radar, Radar mission. Uh, that's tight. It's a tight one. Yeah. I'd like to address what the hell is going on with Lord of the Rings video games. 
Oh, yeah. Weird, huh? Yeah, it's really weird. Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There, wait, is that the full question? Or Yes, that's the full question. <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you something. There's a lot of money in this world, and a, a lot of evil people have money, okay? But a lot mm-hmm. of the money itself is evil because it's trickled through enough like uh, enough right angles of evil in the the plumbing of of the world the global economy and there's just a lot of of money that's just dark sticky sludgy and dangerous you know and that i believe is is what has happened to the lord of the rings video games uh, yeah <laughs> that's my I, I don't really know what else to say all i know is that Gollum one is insane right yeah it's uh, it's just apparently a, a decent idea on paper and now there's another one there's a, a dwarf one right because mm-hmm. that's what everybody wanted when they saw lord of the rings they wanted a video game about Gollum, and they wanted a video game where you're a dwarf is that what people this is wanted? sounding a lot I like guess that's the, what everybody wanted it's sounding a lot like the walking dead yeah. right where it's like there's an ip that exists and people think that they can sell stuff based on it and so they license like five different video games mm-hmm and didn't like EA just announce that after losing that Embracer Group deal that they're like, okay, well, we're just going to go hard on making Lord of the Rings games from now on. Yeah. Strange stuff. Strange stuff. Yeah. The Gollum game was interesting in that, I don't know, they they, they issued an apology. So peop, uh, for people <laughs> oh, who don't yeah. know, people didn't like the game very much. They didn't think that it was great. And uh, rather than being like, oops. Okay, the developer issued a public apology for the game not meeting people's expectations and how they were going to make it better. I feel like that's a big mistake and a big problem that we got going on where people are like, I don't know, if it's not it's the fault of a number of factors if that game is not good. Chief yeah. among them is is, you know, money and production time and all these things and to apologize like no the people you apologize to aren't going to be happy. They're going right. to be like, oh, you should have done it right the first time. Or yeah, apologies uh, to... are tricky. Yeah. I feel like the only time video game people accept an apology is when it also comes with a lot of free stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I mean, okay, so I think uh, when a game is as bad as the Gollum game apparently is, again, having not touched it myself and having virtually no interest in doing so outside of seeing a couple of... Uh, a couple of pretty stupid looking clips and gifs on on social media um my my gut instinct having uh you know worked in a variety of endeavors creative uh, and electronic around the world gut instinct is it's just bad management inexperienced management management who just takes a, an entire art form or medium uh, very lightly and figures that anybody can do this you know i figure like that's the sort of thing that happens in a case like this is uh it's just a butterfingered management, right? It's yeah. probably what it is, right? Something like that. I'm not a genius for thinking this, but you should be able to make a whole lot of money on a really good video game based on Lord of the Rings, right? It shouldn't really be that quote unquote hard. It it could it should be arduous and require diligence and uh, attention to detail. Uh, it it should not require any Herculean feats of uh, miraculousness, right? So I mean, yeah. we don't need any Hercules miracles uh, to occur for a lord of the rings video game to be yeah, all, uh, all the successful. world building is right there for you they he, he done built it already uh, yeah. you know what all the characters are and what they're like are there any good weird lord of the rings games that predate the movies um there's a bad one for super nintendo that i like i hope yeah. that doesn't count though uh, uh, i think uh that. wasn't wasn't melbourne house like built off of a lord of the rings game Just yeah the lord of the rings like wasn't that like their entire deal was they got rich. Maybe it was The Hobbit. I don't remember, but yeah, uh, it, it funded Australian uh, Australian game development apparently for. Oh wow, for, good for them! For a long time, yeah. Good job, Australia. Um, so Australia got built off uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings video games, and New Zealand got built off the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought uh, Australia was a prison colony that's a joke uh not a good one uh, that was before the lord of the rings video games uh, now they're primarily known for that so you're telling me a bunch of ex-convicts made a lord of the rings video game oh yeah it's like dave's killer bread but with video games oh god Man, i love it i don't want to get into dave's killer bread that's too complicated <laughs> yeah dave's killer wow. bread is a first of all first of all i'm on the keto so yeah. i don't eat no bread at all and if i were gonna eat bread um, I live in New York City where we love our – people love sandwiches here. So I, I, mm-hmm. I have no shortage of breads that I can uh, walk outside and uh, have thrown into my stomach 
like a like a past basketball, you know. Am I supposed to stop eating it? That's all I need to know. Dave's killer uh, bread? No, yeah. it you okay, don't have great. to. It's com- it's cool. complicated, but you don't have to, no. Okay. You, you know all what? Right. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Brandon is uh opposed to any bread that promotes killing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, I, I like that Alvarado <laughs> Street, Frank. Try that one. Uh, all right. All right. I want to talk about the name CRPG. It's bad. The word console also starts with a C. What are we going to do about this? Well, no, CRPG means combat RPG. It's RPGs <laughs> that are about uh, like Call of Duty is a combat yeah. RPG where you're playing the role of a combatant. Oh. I thought it was cool RPGs, just the, f- the good ones. I want to defer to, to Felipe here. Everyone shut up. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's actually a huge problem because it doesn't make sense, which means right. that the title of my book doesn't make sense anymore. It used to make a bit more, you know, when we started the project like 10 years ago, because it was a bit more split. But now you, you can play like Planscape Torment on the PlayStation and you mm-hmm. can play like uh, every Final Fantasy on the PC. So like, what's the point anymore in saying like computer RPGs or console RPGs or tabletop RPGs? It's... It's really weird, but I cannot go back and change the name. So I'm just like sticking to it, having using some charm, you know, like, oh, it's like retro. Yeah, I got confused with this whole term because, I mean, I, I will admit right here on this show that I didn't really know what CRPG meant until about a year ago when I was talking to a member of my team who plays them because, you know, she's a Eastern European and plays a lot of those Western computer rpgs and i guess there's style as much as they're like a jrpg and a crpg you can sort of infer certain things from saying those terms even though neither of those actually describes a format or a mechanic or a genre really they they describe a point of origin or a point of uh distribution which doesn't make any sense but i guess in my understanding computer rpgs CRPGs are like the kind of menu and systems driven RPGs that tend to have a lot of freedom and a lot of like fallouty kind of vibes where you can roll your characters much more uh, D&D base, but quite often not necessarily fantasy. Well, I guess that doesn't factor in, but uh, more D&D based than your, your JRPG is another terrible term. Uh, is, am, am I in the ballpark here? Yeah, like from my understanding, like uh, it comes from, let's say, like you said, a more European community. And for them, you had like tabletop uh, RPGs. You had the computer RPGs, which was most of them. And some, the JRPGs were like the console ones because you didn't have the Japanese games on PC, like at least in Europe, it was something that didn't reach them. And like you said, over time, it evolved into like a genre. So like... You say like, oh, you have roguelikes, you have, let's say, uh, tactical RPGs, you have uh, action RPGs, and you have the CRPGs, which will be something like uh, Baldur's Gate or Fallout. Very, like, hardcore, like you mentioned. Yeah, and it's it's funny because, of course, in Japan, RPGs also originated on the computer, like on the PC-88 and stuff. You got your Dragon Slayer and whatnot. They're coming out in 83 and just pre- predating dragon warrior and dragon quest uh which is the same thing um it's uh it's weird it the the terms get all muddled and confused and and this is why i didn't know what it meant because i'd never really tried to look into it for for so long but it is sort of like a if you know you know kind of thing i guess and like you said it's very regional like uh in japan people say talk about like drpgs and no one knows what that is outside of japan they call like dungeon crawlers or yeah lobbers yeah what is a drpg uh it's it's a crpg but they need to get their grades up <sighs> thanks but yeah i guess that's a dungeon crawler uh with first person aspect yeah, yeah like wizardry is a drpg right yeah yeah that that kind of game I, I recall hearing the term in my years uh, as a video game professional in Japan. I recall hearing DRPG brought up before. So that's what I was always assumed it was. I just assumed Wizardry was the was a DRPG. Etrian Odyssey uh, is, a, is a DRPG. Dragon Master Silk is a DRPG. Yeah. Shining, wait, which one? Shining, not Wisdom, Shining the Holy Ark. Shining the Holy Ark is loosely, is a, is a loose kind of a console DRPG. Yeah. I think I think CRPG as a term is fine. 
uh, especially when you're you're using it to refer to uh, largely historical games. I mean, there's there are modern CRPGs, and I think if you call Disco Elysium or Pillars of Eternity or uh, Divinity Original Sin, if you call those CRPGs, I still think that that feels right to me. Right? Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't feel wrong to me. Disco to call Elysium that. feels a little out of the zone for me compared oh, to the other yeah. you mentioned. But I, yeah, but it still feels right to call it yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. in the book. CRPG adventure game. Could you? Could you? Could you keep just adding descriptors to it? I feel like there are there are. This is there could be a potential future question for this show. Uh, what are video games that perfectly name a video game that perfectly fits into a genre? Ooh, you yeah. know, like, like uh, there's. There's not it's a like whole Like Street lot. Fighter into fighting game. Yeah, basically, it's it's they're the you know a game that's not a building block of a genre. Yeah, maybe that's an impossible question to to answer without a million billion caveats, which uh, would I suppose illustrate the point. But it's a It'd be fun yeah, to try. that makes it a topic. Yeah, it makes it a decent one. Here's my next question. It's very easy to divide most of video game history into console generations, but how do you delineate PC game history? Oh, that's a very good question. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Direct X. I think Direct X is my line. Like you Direct know, you X. could. I also think there's only been like three console generations. I think we're overdoing it. Um, mm. Oh yeah, I would be interested in that as a as yeah, a topic I, yeah, later. Put that one aside, <laughs> Jaffe. Like, let's come up with the insert yeah. credit console generation. What are the actual console generations? Yeah, um, I like that we're planning a much better future episode. <laughs> yeah, but I actually think it's just before and after Direct X is pretty much it, right? Like, you could go. You're not going to say pre Windows before and after. Oh, I guess, well, yeah. I mean, Windows existed yeah, yeah, yeah. before Direct X, right? Like, yeah, like, that's what I'm and thinking. Windows games prior to Direct X were not very good, and like, can't really even run them anymore. Like, they were, they were, they were pretty niche. You know, they they were experimental. Like, is there a market here? But but really, as soon as Microsoft made Windows a console, basically, right, by having libraries that that one could use, that that's the beginning of com- of of. I don't know, the second generation. <laughs> like, I think there's been two of computer games. I think you could argue, though, uh, that there's more with, like, Windows 95 has a has a vibe to it versus some others. Also, when you get into Japan, you got all the uh, non-Windows systems like the FM Towns and the PC-88, PC-98, and those definitely had their own specific eras but pc 98 continues into like 1996 1997 with toho games or, or like actually the late 90s uh which is wild stuff so it's it, it feels like a video game design ethos would be a better delineation than the hardware itself somehow i would go for like operational system because you have to differentiate between like let's say apple 2 and the commodore 64 to the amiga games it was such a, a giant leap forward you know yeah that's fair actually i would i would actually now that you say that something like the amiga feels like direct x to yeah, me the amiga has to be second gem yeah like that like that feels like the same kind of leap as 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 something like a direct x it's like it's a common os um that yeah i think yeah you're making me question my own stuff here the zx spectrum is is like the visual style of that is unique it's and not that much different than like cga or whatever yeah it has a unique visuals they all did i mean it's different from cga in that like the way that you could display colors like you had to work around that because you, you couldn't have two two different colors on top of each other but they're so all you're... like unique islands they're not generations you know like like you have to say the yeah. spectrum is its own generation which it's yeah, not so it might it might be like the uh the wild west generation the consolidation yeah. generation and then after or something experimental generation there might be i would say like you have like the first very early generation of like apple commodore then yeah. you go like to let's say the the amiga when you have like a, a visual interface and mouse controls and yeah, like yeah good yeah. sound cards yeah amiga amiga and like dos in like the 90s is kind of like yeah and then you get into windows yeah. and let's say i don't know if you should split windows and put like when you we get like a uh, good 3d graphics or like uh yeah then then it's really hard after 95 to split it yeah i agree with that mm, yeah yeah hard to split it but you sure can tell the difference between a computer game from 1995 and one from today so that it feels like there's at some point you got to make a split there well, well, sure, but you can also tell the difference between like 
you know, an Xbox 360 game and one from today. And I, I don't think there's anything that different. Like that's the same generation. Oh, me. we could have an argument about that one too, because I think <laughs> that you and I can tell the difference, but I don't think that my dad could. Fair, hmm. fair. Oh. But even then, I don't care that we can tell the difference. I'm saying that's the same generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be technology like always online and stuff like this that like made a bigger impact than the graphics on processors. Mm -hmm. That's what I think for consoles for sure. Yeah. Like, internet. Like yeah, the internet. Like like the the beginning of digital distribution is is my cutoff for the 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 current generation of consoles. But we're not talking about that yet. That's a future episode. Yeah, like the moment we move to Steam digital distribution and DLCs, that is com completely different from like ninety five, ninety eight. Yep. Yeah, I think there's an argument for CD-ROM. Yeah, want to get really into it, but like as as a I don't know, I I prefer there only being like three or four generations tops. Like even comics are getting stupid now. Yeah, they are. Comics kind of uh, that's a whole other thing. There's a new generation literally every two to three years now. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. speeding up. Uh huh. Oh boy. I think you've got you've got uh, pre DirectX, DirectX, Steam, or CD ROM, Steam. Is are these the ones we're all throwing out here? DirectX and CD ROM are kind of the same time, I'd say. Yeah. If, if we're trying to wrap this up, right? I think it's like you know, there there's the super early stuff that I don't think we even talk about. Then there's the sort of like Apple II generation, right? And yeah. then I would say the next big leap is uh, DirectX and CD ROM, sort of at the same time. And then I would, yeah, I would go like digital distribution time starting in, I don't know, 2005 or whenever Steam was. I will still add the Amiga generation or like when they mm -hmm. put the mouse controls and, and graphical yeah. interface. Yeah. I think I'm okay with that. Like, I think that's like, like VGA and, and, and Amiga are kind of the same generation. I, I wonder if there's uh, any way to forecast what's the end stage of PC games. Cause uh, I hear people often these days talk about how uh, there's not any big PC games anymore because everything's a console game with a PC port or, you know, smaller PC games. There's no, like, no mega million budget games that are PC only, right? A lot of the hype around Cyberpunk 2077 was that it felt like the most, the, the like the first game in a long time that was made for PC. It's kind of a more of an anti-conclusion to this question. I, th I think that's become like MMOs and stuff, all the those kinds of things that that require the interface but i guess you could also say star citizen <laughs> yeah but i think like all consoles is the same like we have final fantasy 15 like 16 but i'm waiting for it to come be released on pcs to play mm -hmm. um, yeah that's what i'm doing not me all right i got one more question before the break what's a book about video games that you wish existed but you don't have eight years to write <laughs> nice I, I can talk about mine that i've been quote unquote writing for about 12 years now but haven't written a word um i have this weird institutional knowledge of games made for the nes that were never manufactured like uh, my master list is of just everything including stupid rumors and everything i have a database that i've been maintaining this entire time is is uh slightly over 500 titles that were either just, you know, actually made or announced in some official way or, or in some cases were, were reported on, but obviously wrong, stuff like that. Um, realistically, realistically, I think there's about 200 um, that wow. were quote unquote real in some way. This was an era where there's just this perfect storm of factors that created a lot of product that didn't get manufactured, even if it was done and even if it was kind of good. Because everyone's just making a lot of money with whatever game they make. Game development's still fairly cheap um, in comparison to, to your profit margins if, if you're a Nintendo licensee. And Nintendo had that restriction, you know, five games a year. So a company like Capcom might make eight games in a year and, and only put out the five that they felt that they could market. So, you know, I've been collecting material uh this whole time I, I actually have a box right next to me right now of 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 things with you know like screenshots published in obscure places and and i've just I've, i know about titles that no one else knows about i've interviewed people I've, i have i've tried to go up the the chain of command at, at, at who was at nintendo at the time brandon knows that during this dice this last dice summit uh I cornered Don James, the, the oldest NOA employee who's still there, to like ask him about third party submission in the NES days to try to get a handle on how wow. that was done. Um, 
because that was run by two people entirely by two people third party and neither of them will speak to me um <laughs> or or anyone about nintendo they just will not talk about nintendo because that's what nintendo does to people so uh yeah that's a book that i if i can find a way to do like a four-month sabbatical might exist one day but i have just not been able to and i'd really like to it's inside of me it needs to come out nice um i've got two that are way less good than that um <laughs> One is I've been wanting for a long time to do a like a collection of all of my interviews from Game Developer Magazine and Gama Sutra and recontextualize them for modern audience and talk about the situation in which the interview occurred and just various uh, updates since then. That's something I've been wanting to do. And another thing is I have all these game developers that I know in Japan and their friends who have all kind of fallen off of game development. They worked on seminal things from the early days, and then they just sort of disappeared or got shoved to the side or couldn't get the right work or whatever. And I want to talk to those people about their experiences and their lives and stuff during video games and after video games and how just kind of about how the industry over there can churn people out and forget about them. Uh, so that's another one that I'd like to do also sorry if you can hear people sawing trees in the background here you're good i am in the woods <laughs> someone sawing logs back there they're deep asleep <laughs> they're yeah. literally doing they're just boring them tim do you have either a book inside you or a book that you wish existed in the world independent of you Tim made a book yeah that's my joke. um i just i wouldn't mind having a coffee table book that was uh real big I don't have a coffee table, but someday I might have a room large enough for a coffee table. Uh, a coffee table book that's just uh, lots and lots of Japanese uh, Mega Drive game box arts. Yeah. You have the front on one side, the back on the other, and then the next two pages you get the cartridge and uh, the uh, front manual and back cover. of the manual. Yeah. Yeah. Front of the manual, back of the manual, if the back of the manual is neat. And then you just have a couple hundred of those and a big heavy book that's printed really well. And uh, minimal text. And that's it. That's all I want. Felipe, do you have another book that you ever thought of while working on this book, but it just would take too much out of you? Oh, there's two of them. One of them, like another person has to do it, but one of them I want to do in the future, even if it takes like 10 years or something. Mm. So the one that I want other people to do is about especially Chinese video game history, Ooh. because it's like the most fascinating thing that I discovered while working on the book. It's absolutely gigantic. Like just on PC RPGs alone, we're talking about like more than 200 games made during like the 90s and the 2000s. Their own series, their own like, uh, like their own history. It's like on site is almost, let's say, on par with the United States at the time. And we know nothing about though that yeah. you know they have like the the biggest MMOs, huge uh, RPG series, a bunch of like other games that they play a lot, like uh, Monopoly and stuff like this, which is like a huge series over there, uh, a, a big tradition of visual novels, an entire scene of uh, RPG maker games. We know nothing about those. There is nothing like published, even like in Chinese about those. So it's something that I would really love to have more content about of all the other countries in general, like South Korea has a really big scene. Yeah. Uh, Russia, we don't have a lot of, let's say, books about it either. So that kind of stuff, I would love other people to write because obviously that's a bit outside of me. I have someone inside that community. Yeah, I added some of those games into the CRPG book. There's now on the new edition, there's a section just about, you know, uh, just RPGs that were never translated from France, from Korea, from China. And that is super interesting, but I cannot go further than someone from the community. I mean, you mentioned South Korea. I, I would like Sam Derbu to translate his Korean research from Hardcore Gaming 101 into a book. Yeah, that would be amazing because it's like it's the main source. Even like uh, if you search like for information, even like in Korean, people yeah. reference his English article. It right? Yeah, it's crazy, right? <laughs> like like that. The, he he wrote the definitive history of Korean game development, and and like it could be taken even further, and I'd love it to be. There is one book in Korean that's uh, apparently pretty decent, but obviously I can't read it. it. It's been interesting going out there and talking to people who are like game people in Korea because they don't know a lot about their own history hasn't been regarded as super important. And I remember when I first went over there in 2006, 
or so. And I was talking to various companies and I was talking about their past games and stuff. And they're like, how do you, how do you know about this? Like nobody knows about this kind of stuff outside of here. And uh, it was kind of sad because they're just making a bunch of cool games that were for the local market, but they were actually very good. Like the Quorum series and all the stuff that Sonori did. And there's just so many good games out there that once free to play and online games took over, it just sort of became uh, lost history. And I remember this specific instance where I was talking to Hakyu Kim, who was the director of Ragnarok Online and Granado Espada and all these other games. And he earlier in his life made a couple of games called Lars the Wanderer and Ant-Man 2. And mm -hmm. he had the box for Ant-Man 2 in his office when i was there and i was like oh cool you 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 actually have a copy and he's like no it's just the box uh i don't <laughs> have a copy of the game my mom saw it at like a yard sale uh and <laughs> picked it up for me and she's like my son worked on this <laughs> and that's he got it because his mom found it in some random yard sale that's uh, and, great yeah. i think it was kind of lost at the time but i think it's been found since then is that right yeah yeah it's it's okay. out there now uh felipe i wanted to ask what's the book that you want to spend the next 10 years on so that one is a, is ties to the first one, which is I I think there's a gigantic uh, gap in our knowledge about early online games, especially like mm -hmm. um, browser games and uh, uh, how it's called uh, like Legacy of the Red Dragon, the BBS games. Oh, Lord of the Red Dragon by Seth Abel Robertson. Oh, yeah, just, that kind yeah, of no, thing. Oh yeah, those games owned. Yeah, and like. Not only we have no resources on those, but like if you expand globally, we have we know even less. Like uh, we were talking about Korean games, like the biggest MMOs in the world are from Korea, like stuff like um, uh, Dungeon Fighters, and we know nothing about those. So a book that I really wanted to do, and I I started like to collect information on it already while I was doing the. I was actually trying to put it inside the CRPG book, but it's too big and it's too different. Will it be like to collect a bunch of stories from people who play these games because like you cannot play them anymore. The only thing we have are the stories. So like let's say the very first uh, online RPGs, the very first um, uh, BBS games, the very first Korean RPGs. How I found a really interesting stories about how was the development of muds in China. It was so interesting, you know, like reading the stories about how people will go to work in office buildings and then with like for the government. And it was the only place where they had internet. So they would do their work and then pretend to be working until like 2 a.m. So yeah. they could continue using the, the internet from the Chinese government to play like MUDs. It was such like interesting stories. And I'm trying to like collect some of them so we can get a bit away from the story of MUDs and online games that I hate, that is just like, let's say, MUDs, uh, the very first online RPGs like Habitat, then you go into uh, Ultima Online, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, and it kind of ends. It feels like very limited, so I want to talk more about the other stuff. Yeah, that, that sounds great, and I can't wait to check that out in the 2030s. Uh, uh, we'll be right back after a quick break. I just looked at Seth Abel Robinson's Twitter. I noticed I accidentally said Robertson uh, earlier. It's Seth Abel Robinson. I know that. But he's a, a guy who still, you know, works in uh, independent video games and such. And his most recent tweet is that, I don't know if you all are looking at this, he uh. invented a device that can read uh, Amico game cards. <laughs> wow. That's the only way the, the Amico games will ever be usable. So he made it. there you go. He made the real thing. Yeah, he made a real one. So that's the conclusion of the Amico saga. So the end. He did it. He finished the Amico. Welcome back to Insert Credit. It's time, as we do every week, to return to the dirt bag. This is the point in the show where we go to our many questions submitted to us through patreon.com slash insert credit where those of you who are kind and generous enough to throw us a few dollars a month are able to send us those questions, get monthly bonus episodes, and other exclusive insights into our thoughts and feelings and history with video games. Very soon, I believe, uh, we're going to be dropping a uh, an extended discussion about RPGs for the PlayStation 1. So oh, yeah. 
Uh, That's true. Look forward to that. Our question this week comes from Mel Stone, who asks, Using only four video game characters that have never appeared in an RPG, create the quintessential four-person RPG party. Oh, interesting. Oh, man, this this is going to be a tough one when uh, Project Cross Zone exists. <laughs> yeah, I was I, I was waiting for you to walk into that trap. But you have deftly sidestepped it. Oh, also, have you pl- have you played that game? That game blows. Don't even talk about it. Who cares? It's it's not that good, but it does exist, and uh, it's going to be real hard to think of characters that haven't been in it. For me. I mean, that's not that's not an RPG though. That's a weird, loose little baby tactics kind of game. It's it's a it's a baby tactics. It's a tactics right. game for people who have never played a tactics. Uh, let's, game. But let's let, let's go for the challenge. We can't hold use- on, Felipe. Is a tactics yeah. <laughs> game an RPG? Oh, for sure. There All we right. go. There we go. <laughs> okay. I mean, not this one. Have you played this one? Am I the only person who played this whole video <laughs> no, game? I played it. I played it a bit. Oh, yeah. Not the whole thing. Yeah. Obviously. I played the whole goddamn thing. Obviously, huh? Yeah. I knew it. Yeah. I mean, you okay. can't who wants to get through it? But uh, anyway, let's try. Let's try. Also, I don't agree that all tactics games are RPGs. I just want to say there are some that are not. Uh, I don't think Advance Wars is an RPG. So, for example, et cetera, et cetera. We can get into that at some other point, though. All right. I, w- I want to set the tone right away. Um, I want Tom, the hot dog vendor from Shenmue. Ooh. Okay. But what role does he play in the party? Um, I think that he's uh, probably a healer because he really makes me feel good <laughs> yeah. when, I, when I talk to him. He's like, yo, yo. You know, he's like really happy to see me. Um, so I, I think I think he's he's you know he's our he's our buffer he's our uh, our cheerleader and uh, like he can heal us with uh, with hot dogs or or like pump up our strength right with 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 like praise so so I think he's in our party yeah there could be different effects based on customizing the hot dogs oh yeah, yeah. that's, that's kind of he has tofu do. dogs don't worry. I don't know why this came up for me, but um, I was thinking uh, <laughs> we could get Wild Woody as our as our rogue oh, character. No. I like that. I like that. Okay. He'll stab <laughs> you. He'll he'll erase your pocket so you can steal your stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Forget all the things he does ex- aside from being vicious. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna go. He's the thief. Wild yeah, Woody. Yeah, he's the thief. Wow. Yeah. I was thinking barbarian. I don't know. I feel like his attitude is thiefy. Yeah, I think that um, he's one of those characters where. You don't think much of him until there's a side quest where you get into his backstory and then you actually kind of relate to him. Yeah. Yeah. This is the game that'll make us all fall in love with Wild Woody. Yeah. Tim, yeah. do you have a contribution? I don't know. How much further can we uh, make fun of this que- this reasonably good question? Um, I would say that the main character should be Clive from the game Final Fantasy 16. That's a joke about how people say it's an action game and not, not an RPG. RPG. So there you go. How's that? He's got a big sword. <laughs> I think it should be uh, Clive Barker of Clive Barker's Jericho. Mm-hmm. Oh. Does, he, does he appear as a character in that game? Is he a playable character in that Unfortunately, game? Unfortunately, he's not. No, but you know who does appear in a video game is uh, auteur director David Cage. David Cage. That's right, our buddy. Oh, the wizard. <laughs> yeah. He's I wizard. think we have our magic user. He's some kind of wizard, all right. <laughs> uh, as a Brazilian, I want to nominate Blanca as oh, our yeah. boom. Ah. Of course. I like it. Felipe, can I ask you a question um, about Brazilians? <laughs> sure. Wow. Um, <laughs> when else uh-oh. will you get the opportunity? <laughs> uh, like, how do Brazilian people know when Brazil has been mentioned anywhere in the world? Because <laughs> because I, as soon as somebody says Brazil, there's a, Brazi- a, a Brazilian person like 30 seconds behind, sh- like p- posting flags and then yes. posting Brazil in all caps. And stuff. How, how, is there like a radar? How, how does that work? I mean, we're many, and there's always someone like if you're in a room, there's a Brazilian there. I am the Brazilian <laughs> in this case in this room. That's right. Any other room, there will be another Brazilian. So don't worry. We're we're taking care of you. Yeah, yeah. So you're just always watching, always around, always present. That's comforting. I just remember like mentioning uh, like specific Brazilian uh, 1960s musical artists by name during live streams, like. 12 years ago and instantly getting like 14 brazilian twitter followers like no joke yeah it's like the cool it's the coolest thing in the world it's like i don't know must be cool to think your country's cool yeah, <laughs> yeah imagine right. patriotism <laughs> yeah I love but it. it's not even patriotism it's like we are like the underdogs so we love when someone mm. mentions us it's like oh they know about us they like us <laughs> and it's funny because there's a, a special 
type of YouTuber who exploits this. You know those reaction YouTubers? Oh, yeah, they started guys. to find, they found out that like they can make like YouTuber reacts to like Brazilian music, reacts to Brazilian video, ah. and like he will get like one million comments, like oh he likes Brazilian stuff, and he gets like <laughs> two million views, three hundred thousand comments. So they just start doing this with like every single Brazilian music, uh, movie, and everything, and it's. Personally, I also watch those because it's so funny to see that. <laughs> so it's like, exploitative, but so it, it works. works. <laughs> but it's, it's so interesting because we have like things that are like so kind of like alien to an American and they watch and they're like, I don't understand. And it's so fun to see the confusion. Which reminds me, another book we got to have is The History of Tech Toy, for sure. Yes, I like that. Well, it can't just be Textoy though, because I, I I actually think uh, uh, Gradiente uh, slash Playtronic is is also equally, if not more, fascinating. Um, in that they sure. <laughs> secured a Nintendo license by cloning the Nintendo and creating a market the Nintendo could not beat. Like that's amazing. Yeah, and I think it also has to extend to the Zebo because uh, that was a wild console, and I heard so much behind the scenes dirt about how that console got nerfed at the last second um for cost reasons and feels like you're shoehorning that one in there but sure zebo it was the ceo of tech toy the former ceo of tech toy okay who, all right all right yeah. that's fair all right uh before we like... move on from our ask a brazilian segment i do uh, want to ask is luffy from one piece brazilian oh good question i mean 100 percent for sure at, at least <laughs> it is yes <laughs> that's that's the feeling i, t- I tend to get you know, people are angry that they, they didn't hire a, a Brazilian actor to to make the, the live action version. Right? I can't believe it. Feels like a no-brainer. I know there's a trailer for it. I didn't watch it yet. Uh, who who plays Luffy? Some guy. Some guy. Some guy. Yeah, I think right. he's like a, an American of like Indian descendant, which like uh, kind of works. But Yeah, that works. I don't know. How do you approach a video game magic system in a way that doesn't feel like it's ripping off Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, just rip it off. <laughs> you make it so you have to choose a command to remove magic spells from your enemy so that you can then cast it. That's how you do it. It's pretty smart, huh? You draw the spell? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. draw them and stock them, or you can draw mm-hmm. them and immediately mm-hmm. cast them, but you don't get any more than just the one. Pretty smart, huh? <laughs> well, you know, as... as uh... Katy Perry warned in her 2013 hit uh, Dark Horse, uh, if you want to play with magic, you should know what you're falling for. Right. Yeah, so okay. that should be one of the mechanics. Yeah. Yes, know what you're falling for, I suppose. So ripping off Dungeons and Dragons, what exactly do you consider ripping off Dungeons and Dragons, Alex Jaffe? Um, you What's know, your definition? I, mean, I know that most of the like RPGs that we have from the very beginning of the format uh, kind of took that whole system from early tabletop games like we see that which is to wear like a wizard hat and fake beard in real life and roll a a bunch of dice and say i'm casting my magic missile i think it's more like uh, the fact that that you like spend mana to cast spells (laughs) and they have like different effects on different types of enemies like it's all very very codified and I'd like to start thinking about magic outside the bun. The thing about D&D is that they use that magic system like the Vention, which was inspired by Jack Vance, right. which you spend magic, like you remove from your memory. So like you don't use mana. You, let's say, you memorize a fireball, you cast it, and then it's gone until you rest. Right. So for me, when you say like D&D, D&D inspired, I'm thinking about this system. Like uh, mana is already like something very different. I suppose so. I feel like if you want to do something different, you just uh, make the magic more contextual. I, I, I feel like though Shin Megami Tensei is sort of in the same vein with the the uh, spending points and things, but it, it's it's all about exploiting weaknesses and stuff. So if you're working more on, uh, inv- I mean, I guess there's they, there's still environmental or uh, rather elemental concerns with D and D magic, but I feel like if you remove the the hit points and remove the magic points and it's all just about compatibility that would be a different way to do it uh i guess it's more rock paper scissors then i feel like in all of the 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 more modernish turn-based rpgs uh you know people always complain about there not being turn-based final fantasy or whatever there's like octopath traveler bravely default right i feel like they've always had 
they've they've been doing interesting sort of outside the the MPHP box uh, magic system thinking. I, I feel like Final Fantasy IV Warriors of Light for the DS or whatever it was called, Four Heroes of Light, whatever they called that game, had a pretty interesting magic system where you just kind of get to use magic and uh, you have to save up uh, your your points which are accumulated during battle. This is a very boring uh, way to phrase it. I think Final Fantasy 16 does a cool thing with the magic points system. And uh, you can experience this in the demo if you play the demo. Where, again, as we just, just clarified, it's not an RPG. But uh, it's uh, you, you play as the main character. And then you later play as his little brother, who is a powerful magic user. And uh, the main character can use magic as like a distance attack. Like a Dante Devil May Cry kind of gun attack. But it's very weak and it's very fast, and you just get unlimited usage out of it. You can use it to chip dudes. You can use it in combos. But then when you play as your little brother for a minute, his magics are really big and uh, and just basically rip dudes in half, right? But but your your little brother is also uh, very ill, so he coughs and uh, uh, wheezes a lot. So every time you use magic, he like stops and bends over and has to catch his breath so he like rips the dude up from across the room and then he's catching his breath now this wouldn't work as what i would consider a magic system if he didn't also have a melee attack right which you can use as well so um i feel like we're just now getting into an era where there's magic in action games there's that ea first person spellcaster looking game whatever that's called coming out yeah they they have that si- or something similar in uh, Tokyo God darn thingy game Ghost that I like. Ghostwire Tokyo. Yeah. It, there's that in there. I also like the Phantom Dust approach where you have to run around and collect your magic from the world. Like yeah. there's just these nodes and you gotta go grab them and then you can use them for the amount of, of instances that you have grabbed. That's pretty fun and is more action-y, but to me it felt like a a more connected to the environment sort of magic like uh, you know i like those earth sea books and it and it's all about like drawing forth the elements from from things that are around you or that are um within you or but you have to be able to connect to something uh i think that kind of stuff could be further explored somehow it's just like that is one kind of game that i really like which are the games that put a magic as a solution to quests and to to dialogues and you don't see this a lot it's mostly like in fan games there is one mod for Neverwinter Nights 2 that I absolutely love. It's called the Maimed God Saga. It's, it is Dungeons and Dragons, like literally. You have to play as a cleric, and the spells you can either use them in combat or you use to solve quests or like uh, puzzles and things like this. And it's so interesting how it it is Dungeons and Dragons, but they play completely different from any other RPG because you're not just let's say like uh, fighting the undead. If you meet someone who, let's say, like is the evil governor of the island and you want to know if he's lying to you, you can use the spell Ooh. to figure that out instead of like a, a, a die roll or something like this. But then you don't have the spell later because of the way that uh, cleric spells work. You, let's say you cannot heal later because you wasted your spell to find this out. And it's such an interesting concept, but you don't see that. And it's much closer to how tabletop RPGs usually play. And I... It's something I wish we had more in games. Yeah, so I guess one possible solution here to make it, uh, magic seem less generic is to lean even more into Dungeons and Dragons. I like that. Yeah, it's what let's say Divinity Original Sin did, like uh, going more into tabletop and making like a better computer RPG that way. All right, I've got one more topic that we have time for before we close up. We've got your old console games covered by our blanket advice of get a mister. But what should our listeners know about getting ancient computer games to run the right way on their modern PCs? DOSBox. Get a mister. (laughs) Yeah. It's fair. (laughs) Like, anything if you go beyond DOS, like, emulating an Amiga, even for someone who's, like, experienced, unless you use, like, let's say, the proper tools, it is so difficult. So I completely understand why, like, people don't play Amiga games, people don't play yeah. O2 games and stuff like this. It's really hard. I really wish we had the DOS box or, like, something on Steam. You know, like, we were talking before about the PC-88 games. Yeah. Like, 
you have to almost like know Japanese and like be very familiar with all the technology and everything to play any of those games. I would really love a way for them to be accessible because honestly, they are not accessible right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'd be great if the PC 98 or FM Towns UI got a translation hack so that you could. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll be playing an FM Towns game and then I'll get a like a floppy disk error that has kanji that are too complicated for me to read and i'm like well i guess i just won't play this because i don't understand this error message that would be nice someone is actually trying to uh to dump all fm towns games and they they're apparently like 20 away i don't believe that they're actually 20 away from finishing it but that's what they say this is exciting but have you seen that um uh, apparently do you know project egg the yes yeah so apparently they are doing a version of that for switch an official version and that could be like what we need. Imagine, even if it's just, yeah. like, say, for the Japanese store, imagine if on your Switch you could play, like, all the old East games, all the old, like, very old PC RPGs for the PC-88 on your Switch. That would be Has amazing. Has Project X evolved beyond MSX? Yeah, they, no, it's Project Egg. They have, like, also the the PC-88, PC-98. They yeah. have, oh, I think, okay. uh, I FM Pounds, too. Yeah, maybe FM7 that, as well. That's a good stuff for, like, you can purchase legally available games and they just work. Um, not really great as like tools for deeply exploring the library. Um, I don't have anything for the Japanese computers, but I'm going to name some specific stuff for uh, American computers. So for Commodore 64, you want something called C64 Dreams. Mm -hmm. um, it is a front end uh, focused curated collection of Commodore 64 stuff that you double click and it works and all the manuals are in there and everything. So it's just, it's just an experience where you go through and, and there's even filtered lists for like best of and stuff like that. Um, for the Apple II, you want something called total replay, which is an Apple II, uh, a hard drive image um, that has many, many games in a front end, all of which are joystick compatible. And it's just, you know, a cool like flash cart interface for the Apple II with uh, with with games that just work. You launch them, they're they're, they're they just they just run. Um, for the Amiga, you want um, something called Amiga Vision, formerly called Mega AGS. Uh, this is something I told Tim to to get on his Mister, but it's oh, available it. in all kinds of places, um, including an actual Amiga. But um, well, I really like that it's available on the analog pocket. So there's just like a complete front ended Amiga that you really uh, want to play Amiga games on an analog pocket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't, and I don't. But uh, but yeah. uh, on my Mister, it's great. So those are the sort of the three like main. Oh, and then for um, for for DOS, I would do uh oh god, ExoDOS, E X O D O S. Um, is very similar to C sixty four Dreams. It's a uh, uh, in fact, it uses the same front end software, the same off the shelf one. Um, and it's similar in that it's a curated set with box art and manuals. And like he even includes every magazine that reviewed DOS games. So ExoDOS kind of... is, is, is also a, a barber shop in Brooklyn, New York. Great. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is, this is good. You're going to love this. It's a, it's on 666 Liberty Avenue. Nice. Oh, yeah. It looks like this is where, uh, where Brandon Sheffield needs to get a haircut. 666 Liberty <laughs> Avenue true. sounds like a great CRPG game. Yeah, Lord. <laughs> Exodus, dude. Exodus. Didn't DC Comics used to be 666 Fifth Avenue? That's true, yes. Yeah. when they, they That was their New York office. Yeah. God, that owns. That's because it stood for Devil Comics. Exactly. Yeah. That that was the original DC. All right. I think we're out of time. So those are some real answers there. What's up? What's up? Exodus is also Greek for the final scene in a tragedy. So nice, which Sorry. is exactly what you want going into the barber shop. Yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, that's for, yes, pretty. Yes, this is good. about to be a tragedy, a Greek tragedy. Uh, this is the point of the show where, if you have any recommendations for our audience, things that you are working on or are proud of or uh, are not associated with, but would like to direct people's attention towards in general, uh, this is the time to do that. I, I haven't done this in a while, so I'm, uh, um, I do have an additional podcast, and maybe this should just be part of the sign off, Jaffe. Maybe it should be like you know, if you if you like this, there's some other podcasts for that our people are on. Um, just make but, it the very last thing mentioned on every podcast uh, yeah. episode, just a call to action. Why yeah, not I listen to a that. different podcast? Right, um, but uh, I, I, I co-host a podcast called the Video Game History Hour, 
Um, it's available uh, everywhere. It's a credit is as far as I know. Um, mm-hmm. real great. Uh, Felipe Pepe, uh, former now former, uh, uh, guest of the insert credit show has been, <laughs> has been a guest on, on the, the video game history hour as well. He's, he's, he was, uh, just as good, maybe even better. Uh, on our show wow i listened it. to that yeah. episode to prepare for this episode yeah he was great on that one right he was so uh yeah go 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 subscribe to that um because it's it's real good and you get to hear my voice some more uh without these other guys and some yeah. kelsey lewin you love kelsey, kelsey lewin. lewin as well yeah uh i got some i'm gonna recommend uh a, a band called il balletto di bronzo which is an italian rock band from the 70s they have an album called serio 2222 which is pretty cool if you like that old style 70s rock from Europe, uh, like uh, all the Hungarian stuff and wh- whatnot. It's pretty cool. I also would like to recommend that you please pre-order physical hyper gun sport if you if you like to have physical things. Oh, that's tomorrow as of this recording, right? As of this as of this recording, tomorrow is when it starts. Uh, it will have been started, but there, there's like a month pre-order period. But uh, so I'm going to mention it again. Looks like every console has unique art on the cover. That's kind of cool. Every console has unique art on the cover and a unique art uh, like flip thing. Um, we had a different artist do a a back cover Whoa. for each. Sounds like you're going after the audience of a guy who buys. <laughs> Buys, buys, every, buys every copy of the buys game and it doesn't copy. doesn't play any of them. Well, l- let me tell you what. Uh, we need money. <laughs> yeah, go for it. You know, get it, get in, and pick that money up where you can. We need money. If people wanna, if people wanna not buy physical <laughs> things, go ahead and buy Hyper Gun Sport on Steam or Switch or PlayStation Five or xbox or whatever but if you're gonna buy it physical buy every version of it buy or, every yeah. or, the, or you're the two playstation jerk. ones have a little have a little uh gun sport ball on the spine that matches up if you put them next to each other um uh, i thought that was cute anyway uh buy those so that we can finish making demon school <laughs> yeah uh yeah the end goodbye forever mm-hmm Felipe, where can people find the CRPG book? Yeah, so like Frank uh, mentioned, like I went to his podcast a while ago and was super interesting to talk to him and like talk more about the history of the games. And on that episode, I mentioned a lot about like how uh, I think the book failed in addressing like more uh, Chinese, Korean games and stuff like this, things outside the canon. And the, the good thing is like in the years since, we expanded the book actually to include those games. Mm-hmm. And we now we have like it's available as a free PDF for everyone to download on our website, which is the crpgbook.com, and uh, you can get the game, the book there. And next month, next month now, uh, yeah, when people are listening this next month in August, we're releasing the the physical version. We're releasing the hardcover version of this updated book, which oh. has like. A lot of new games. It goes nice. all the way to Disco Elysium. It has the Chinese games. It has a whole section about uh, RPG Maker uh, history, MMOs. Uh, we got a proofreader to check everything. So that is coming out uh, by Bitmap Games in Bitmap Books in August. And but you can already download the free PDF on our website. Good people at Bitmap. Yeah, I checked out the PDF. It's a beautiful book. I, I don't know who was in charge of the uh, like the graphic design of the book, but it's a it's a very attractive volume. I was nice work. I've got some recommendations. If you've enjoyed this episode of Insert Credit, please rate and review our show wherever and however you can. You can also support us on patreon.com slash insert credit, where you can become a patron to submit your own questions, listen to monthly bonus episodes, and get more exclusive content. If you'd like to sponsor our show with an advertisement or personal message, it's easy and affordable to do so. Just contact us at show at insertcredit.com. You could also join our community at forums.insertcredit.com or find videos of these episodes on youtube.com slash insert credit show. Wishlist Demon School on Steam by Brandon yeah. Sheffield's own Necrosoft Games. Listen to our sister podcast, The Video Game History Hour, with Frank Cifaldi and Kelsey Lewin. Wow, immediate, immediate uh, response to <laughs> request. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> we deliver here. Uh, this episode is edited by Esper Quinn with original music by Kurt Feldman. You can find Kurt Feldman's music at kurtfeldman.bandcamp.com. I'm Alex Jaffe. I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm Tim Rogers. I'm Brandon Sheffield. And I'm Felipe Pepe. And it is now safe to turn off your computer.
Is nice. That, uh, is that Thanks. Thing? <laughs> Jaffe, I had, I had wanted you to read this. Uh, yes, I remembered that at the but, very last but minute, I'll, but I didn't put it into, I, I forgot to put it into That's okay. I'll, the, I'll read yeah. it to you all right now because it's fun yeah. to me. So there is a review of the show that uh, was from someone called underscore blind, I guess. Um, and the title of the review is Game Over Yeah. And then it says, no other podcast will spend this much time detailing store brand cereal from Aldi. Five stars. And then the actual mm-hmm. review is two stars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that must have been a mistake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably a mistake. Probably a mistake, but still funny. 